As we begin our new study in the first chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, we want to take a few minutes to look at the backdrop of this epistle and learn a little bit about what this first chapter is laying in the way of a foundation and a little bit about the potential authorship of this epistle so that we know where it's heading and what the intent is. In other words, what it's trying to establish. Now, the entire theme of chapter 1 establishes Jesus Christ as the Son who is the eternal God, who is described as being from everlasting to everlasting in Psalm 90, verse 2. We find such statements as the Lord has spoken unto us by his Son in these last days, in verse 2, by whom he made all the worlds. We find him being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. He's expressly called the propitiation of our sins in the expression in verse 3, when he had by him, by himself, purged our sins. And his location right now is even given in verse 3 as being seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. We're told about Jesus that he's greater than the angels, so much better than the angels. He has obtained a more excellent name than they by inheritance, that is, by being the Son of the Most High God. In fact, God the Son. He's compared to the angels in verse 5, being a son rather than a creation. In verse 6, he's indicated as one who is worthy of worship, whereas no other angel is. He said, and let all the angels of God worship him. In verse 7, we're told, that God says of this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. They all serve him. He said unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. The Lord Jesus Christ's throne, he is the ruler. He is King Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. His scepter is of righteousness, and his scepter is eternal. He holds it and wields it forever. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity in verse 9. He has been in the beginning from the foundation of the earth in verse 10, and the heavens are the work of his hands. They will perish. They'll all wax old as a garment. But the Lord will always remain. This is reiterated in chapter 13, verse 8, when we're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is everlasting from eternity past through eternity future. He shall fold them up. That is the present heaven and the present earth. But he is always the same. They will be changed, but he is always the same. He shall never fail. God the Father never said to any angel, Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies my footstool. He never said that to any of the angels, but in Psalm 110, he said that to his son. He said that before he was born prophetically. And in verse 14, we actually learn the position of angels in contrast to the position of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are indeed ministering spirits who will minister, that is, who will serve those who are heirs of salvation, and that is us. 
We also find some very interesting things throughout the book of Hebrews that we should look at for a few moments before we look in more detail at chapter 1. There is no clear-cut evidence as to the authorship of this book, and it's been questioned and debated, and many people have said that there are different options for who could have written this book. But there are several indications, several very strong indications, that it is very likely that the Apostle Paul actually wrote this book. Now, while he may not have actually been the person to put pen to paper and written the book, written this epistle, it is likely that Paul was the one who commissioned the book to be written. And we see this in a number of places. In Hebrews 10, verse 34, he makes reference to the recipients of this epistle having compassion of him in his bonds. Now, no, he's not the only one who had been incarcerated for uh, preaching the faith and teaching the faith of Jesus Christ, but that's an evidence. In Hebrews thirteen nineteen, he yearns to be with the saints again. He desires to be restored to be among the saints once again. In Hebrews 13, 23, and 24, he says that Timothy, excuse me, should soon be set at liberty from Italy. Paul is the only one that we have record of at this time who was actually incarcerated and taken all the way to Rome because he was, in fact, a Roman citizen and he demanded an audience before Caesar. And so he was taken there. Another reference outside of the book of Hebrews that we have, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, Peter talks about looking toward the new heaven and the new earth, making an allusion to the fact that we are looking for another place, another country, another world in which we're going to live in, and that this is not our home. And he specifically specifically references Paul as the one who tells us this. He makes a specific reference to Paul as being the one who gives us the information that this is not our world. This is not the place where we will spend our eternity. And in fact, in Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16, Paul makes that reference that the Old Testament saints sought a place because they knew this was not their world, this was not their country, this was not their land. They sought a greater place, a heavenly place. So we do have a number of references that perhaps Paul was intimately involved in the writing of this epistle. Now, some of the arguments have been that it's written in a much more refined type of writing than what Paul did, that um, it was perhaps not written as skillfully, uh, or it was written more skillfully than Paul had written the other epistles, but you have to remember some epistles that were, that Paul was given credit for writing. He actually did not physically pen himself. He dictated and they were penned by someone else, uh, which may well be the case here as well. So we can't always take that at face value, but we do know that they're inspired by the Holy Spirit and then they are put down by the hand of man so that the personality of the man comes through in the writing, but the power of God through the Holy Spirit and the truth of God through the Holy Spirit comes to light. So let's begin with the exegetical study here in verse 1. 
God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now verse 1 simply tells us that through the Old Testament prophets, God gave us Old Testament scripture. But verse 2 is telling us that in these last days he's spoken to us through his Son, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who has physically come upon the earth, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And that this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we learn of in Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2, is the creator of all things, and he is the one who, in whom dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he is the one who has been appointed heir of all things, and who is the creator of all things. This is where we have the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, introduced. And we're going to see throughout this chapter him being developed, as we looked at a little bit earlier, we're going to see him developed as the propitiation, as the mediator, as later on as the testator. We're going to see him developed as the one and only one who could be the propitiation, the substitute, the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This again refers back to the Lord Jesus Christ being indwelled with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is very God in person, in the flesh, on earth. The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. There is no difference between the Father and the Son. They are two facets of the same threefold Godhead. There are There is no difference between the two of them. One reflects the other. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, there is no other way to have your sins purged. You cannot receive absolution from a priest. You cannot do penitence. You cannot scourge yourself. You cannot do good works. The only way to receive forgiveness of sins is to throw yourself on the mercy of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who has sacrificed himself, sacrificed him his entire self and shed his blood by taking upon the weight of the sins of all of the world, of all of mankind for all eternity. And his blood will cover your sin. That's it. From thenceforth, you live to serve him. That's your desire. That's your heart. That's your love. That's your love for him because he first loved you. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to go to heaven. There is no other route. He is the only one who can purge sins. God himself. Where is he now? He is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. The place of power. He has the power. He is the judge. He is the king. He is the righteous judge. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Being made so much better than the angels in verse 4 
as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In fact, he has obtained the most excellent name of all. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none above him. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is none above the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not a created being. He is eternal. Verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And this is from Psalm 2, Psalm 2, 7. And the sense of begotten is not that at some point in time Jesus did not exist, and then he was born in the form of a natural man. No, the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed Mary, a human woman, and as a result, Jesus was conceived. Jesus was God in heaven. Jesus was conceived as a man so that he could be man on earth as the God-man. He walked the earth as man so he could know all of our frailties as we know them, suffer them yet without sin, and then die in our place to take away our sin. Our responsibility in that is to receive his sacrifice as a free gift. No angel is called a son. They are creations. Jesus is the only son. And again, verse 6, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. We are told back in the Old Testament, we can only worship God. It is the first commandment that we can only worship God. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, he says. He will not, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's not going to allow anybody to be worshipped. Even the angel who showed John around heaven and the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation. John tried to bow down to him a couple of times and he said no. He said, I'm a servant like you are. He wasn't a man, he was an angel, but he said, I'm a servant like you are can't worship me. You can only worship God. Only God will allow himself to be worshipped. No one else. And of the angels he saith, who maketh, maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. These angels are servants. These angels do God's bidding. And these angels are very powerful servants extremely powerful servants. They're part of his army. That's why they're called a host. The heavenly host, the word host means army. And they do fight Satan's minions, his demons, his evil angels in the heavenly realms and here in the earthly realms. They are very, very powerful, but they do it under God's orders and they do it under his restraints as well. But they are very powerful and very mighty, much more so than mankind. But they are not heirs to salvation, nor are they gods. Verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. Notice he says to his Son, Thy throne, O God. He calls his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God. There are people that question, where is Jesus called God in the Bible? There's one right there, Hebrews 1, verse 8. Thy throne, O God, forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. His scepter is eternal. Scepter is a symbol of power, of absolute power. All power is given to Jesus. There are so many places in Scripture where we're told that all power is given to the Lord Jesus Christ on heaven and on in earth everywhere. This occurs in Psalm 45. We're also going to see references, or we would also see references to this in John 5, 8 and Philippians 2, 6. 
where we see references to Jesus being equal with God and not believing it to be robbery to be equal with God. That is, not believing it to be something that is that is false, not to believe it is something that is untoward to be equal with God, because he is, in fact, God. Verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. People say God can't hate. Oh yes, God hates things that are ungodly. God hates things that are unrighteous. God hates things that are unholy. There are a whole lot of things that God hates. God hates those that sow discord among brethren. There are many things that God hates. People say, oh, God is love. But they also forget, our God is a consuming fire. In fact, at the end of chapter 12 of this very epistle, the author will write that. Our God is a consuming fire. There are things that God hates and there are things that God loves, but they are two sides of the same coin of who God is. And you can't have one without the other. You can't love righteousness without hating iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus knows joy and happiness that we will only know when we get to heaven and enjoy that marriage feast of the Lamb with him. We won't know that joy before then, but we will see glimpses of it here and there on earth and we'll just revel in them sometimes for a moment, sometimes for an hour. But we'll revel in them, in those little moments we have here, but we'll live in them moment by moment when we are in heaven with him. It's interesting that we can cite here that in Psalm 45, 7, we see this reference, and in the Old Testament, Mashiach, and in the New Testament, Christos, they're both the same word. They mean anointed one. In the Old Testament, we translate it in English to Messiah. In the New Testament, we translate Christos to Christ. They both mean anointed one. That is Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ is not a first and last name. Jesus is a proper name, and a very common name, by the way, in the region at the time. Just like Jesus is actually a very common um, Latino name right now. Uh, it's not an uncommon name, and it's not sacrilegious to name your child Jesus. That's a perfectly common name. In the Old Testament, when you wanted to identify who the coming Lord was, the coming Savior of his people, you referred to him as Mashiach. In the New Testament, you referred to him as Christos. Messiah in the Old Testament, Christ in the New Testament. Exactly the same word with exactly the same meaning. Jesus the Christ. Or we've just truncated it to Jesus Christ. Some of us even prefer to say Christ Jesus. Okay. Anointed one, Jesus. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. And of course, this refers all the way back to Genesis 1-1. It agrees with John 1, 1-3, where we find that in the beginning the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And again, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, we see that He made all things, thrones, powers, principalities, everything, physical and non-physical, and that all things are held together by him, whether they are natural or supernatural. Verse 11 is a powerful verse, though. Verse 11 tells us, They shall perish, but thou remainest. And as we mentioned earlier in this book, in this epistle, Hebrews 13.8 actually cites that and really locks that down by saying, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old as doth a garment. This is not the only place that's a reference. We also read that in Psalm 102, verse 26, Isaiah 51, 6, where we learn that this world is 
waxing old. It's getting older. And we do see that things decay with age and with time in the short term, because we all age and die. And we see in the long term, things get older and wear down. And our Earth is waxing old. And our Earth is not millions and billions of years old. It's only a few thousand years old. And it doesn't take very long for it to age out. And it's aging down right now. Verse 12, And as a vesture, and as a vesture, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Now, God is going to take what is here. He's not going to wipe it out. But he's going to take what he has, and he's going to reform it. And here's one of several clues in the New Testament that he's actually going to take what we have and reform it and reshape it, kind of like a metamorphosis. If you think of a butterfly, a butterfly starts out as a caterpillar. It goes into a chrysalis, and inside of that chrysalis, it turns into like caterpillar soup. It does. It turns into just like this grayish soup. And then the DNA does its work. And it comes out, this beautiful butterfly, completely transformed. It doesn't come out as a caterpillar with wings. It comes out as a butterfly, a completely metamorphosized creature, an entirely different insect than, than what went in, an entirely different type of creature than what went in there. It's amazing. Well, that's what the Lord's going to do with the new heaven and the new earth. He's going to take what we have now. He's going to fold it up. And then he's going to change them completely into something completely new called the new heavens and the new earth. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. There's another reference to this changing in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. But again, regardless of this changing, the one who does the changing himself always remains the same. And you know, that's such a blessing. We know that the God who created the heavens and the earth, even before that, we're told in Revelation 13, 8, that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. God prepared the sacrifice that was the offering for the salvation of mankind before the universe had ever been created. He already made a way out for us because he knew how we would fall. He knew we couldn't be perfect, but he loved us just the same. This God has never changed. He cannot change. He will not change. We can always trust him to be exactly the same God who he is. And that's a beautiful thing because that means that we can always trust him to keep his word to keep his promise. If he promises something now, it will happen. If he says that something happened in the past, it did. If he promises us a certain type of future or an event in the future, good or bad, it's going to happen and we can trust that it will happen. We may not always like the way God does something, but it doesn't matter. We can trust that it's going to happen the way he says it will. And that's a blessing. Because we will never be surprised when something happens that God says will happen. We always know it's going to be the truth. And that is a trustworthy God that we can model ourselves after. Verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool? In Psalm 110, prophetically. The Father said this to the Son. He never said this to any angel. He never said this to any other man. He said this to the Lord Jesus Christ. By proxy, this was given to King David, but it was said deliberately and prophetically to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, finally, about angels, and here we learn something very key about angels that we mentioned earlier. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The duty of angels towards believers 
is to serve them. This is where we have one of the most clear-cut examples of having guardian angels. That angels do, in fact, those who are heirs of salvation. We who are saved are heirs of salvation. Paul writes a lot about this in the book of Romans. And with that, we'll close out chapter 1 of Hebrews and look forward to chapter 2, which is where we begin establishing the development of salvation in the Old Testament and the atonement, which carries us through a good portion of the book of Hebrews.